all here today. There are just a few announcements I want to point out to you. First of all, um, today we are having holy time over in the courtyard. We had a coffee and donuts after service and get together to enjoy one another. Uh, notice in the announcements that Noella Nazareth is turning one month in January. And she would like, well, her family would like for her to receive as many cards as possible. Her dress is there, so if you can, please send Luella a birthday card. And, of course, remind you that the offering will be, offering plates will be held by the ushers as you go out by the doors after the service. Please, uh, we, now we we'll prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
God of glory, you sent Jesus upon us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We would confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, forgive and renew us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now please turn to your neighbors and pass the peace.
We recognize that at times we are careless with our action and our greed. Remind us each day that we are to preserve what we have made so that our children's children may inherit lands and seas brimming with life and beauty. Keep the people of every nation from those who would do them harm. Protect them in disaster and war and famine. Be with those who today must leave their homelands and depend on strangers to grant them safe passage to places they do not yet know. We pray today for those who are grieving for lives lost, especially for those lost too young and to the harmful actions of others. May we stop the epidemic of violence in all of its forms. Turn our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks so that the implements of destruction become tools used for building, just as the prophets called upon us to do so long ago. Protect our children and give them lives of safety, hope, and joy. And give us the courage to speak up and take action so that hate has nowhere to thrive. You have created each of us in your very image, and it is a diverse community. May we honor that in our attitudes and actions. We pray today for all of your children who are gathering in all kinds of houses of worship to honor you. And may each of us on this Epiphany Sunday feel the energy of your Holy Spirit so that we may give others new life and hope. Be especially close to those in our community who need you the most. And as we mark the beginning of another new year, remembering the one who came as our Savior, let us remember the kingdom he came to bring, the kingdom that we as his disciples are called to be partners in establishing. We pray these things through Christ, in whose name we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our second reading this morning is the Gospel text from Matthew the end of this portion of the Christmas story, if you will. So continue to listen for God's word to you. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left by their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
thank you for the invitation to share in worship with all of you this morning. Many of you know me. Some of you are here a long time ago when I was running around in this sanctuary as a little one. Um, or you knew my parents, Jim and Biddy, as well as other family members that have been here through the years. So if you'll permit me a moment of personal privilege, I'll share just a few of my memories. Um, of course, our family was here in April as we celebrated Mom's life, just as we did here in 2015, remembering Dad. We've had family weddings and baptisms here, and it's always wonderful to be with you all on any occasion, and to be with people I know well, like Kathy, and those of you that I'm meeting for the first time today. My journey here began when I was baptized, probably using that font by Fred Turner, um, some years ago, um, I attended Sunday school over in the education building with Charlene Drake and a lot of wonderful teachers. I was part of the children's choir here with John Bishop. We used to meet in what was it's now the offices. It was a basement back then. Um, I was part of youth ministry with Dean and Mary Kells and youth Sunday school with Tom and Evelyn Weaver, who put up with a lot from uh, seniors in high school who thought they didn't need to be in Sunday school. And of course, many pastors and staff through the years, Ed Allwright was the person who was here the longest. And as I prepared for professional ministry, uh, Ray Ruark was the pastor. Um, so it's, there are a lot of memories here. And one of them that comes to mind, um, when I was in seminary, I was required to preach in my home church a few times. And so you all were very uh, kind to invite me to do that. And my nephew, Matt Kirk, was a little child then. And he used to sit up in the balcony about where Sandy Clardy is, and um, he would make faces at me, he would run up and down, and one particular time he laid down on the pew with his head over this way and his feet up over the back, kicking me like that, getting my attention, the choir's attention, and entertaining the entire balcony. And he says that it was his contribution to my education. So, uh, I try to remember that we have a balcony in the church where I serve, and lately there have been some very active children up there, and I try to remember, um, I, I trained for this with my own nephew in the balcony, so not that any of you balcony people are doing that today. <laughs> well, we have noted this is Epiphany, and so the season of Christmas, which culturally ended a few weeks ago, really, um, is ended now, and our worship offers us a reflection on this beautiful gospel story of the wise men from the East who went on a journey that they could not have understood as they set out. And it's become in many ways a metaphor for our spiritual journeys that may indeed require us to travel on roads we couldn't have imagined where we experience epiphanies we otherwise might have missed. Epiphany. Um, that is what we call this day. It's, it's simply revelations, insights, enlightenments, those things that give us a glimpse of perhaps how our future will unfold. And many of those seem to start with an observation of something in the created world. You know, we live on this amazing globe which has such a beautiful um, place that we can find to recreate and nourish our bodies and souls. But often what really captures us is that which is above us, which is in the skies. Well, my mother loved the constellations, and one of my memories of being a child is when she would take me outside in the dark night, and she would point out all the constellations that we could see from here in Ocala. Orion and Sirius the Dog Star, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Cassiopeia. And as I shared at her memorial service, decades later, we were on a trip to Alaska, and we were way, way, way on the northern slopes of Alaska. And with our uh, traveling companions, we stayed up every night for nights trying to see the northern lights, and finally they did come. And it was one of our favorite memories um, of those beautiful lights just dancing across the sky. And I was driving up here, um, from the Orlando airport on Friday night. Right as I got into Ocala, there was that big, huge, beautiful moon. And you see a moon like that, um, which we are graced with once a month, and I just could not take my eyes off of it. It's beautiful. There is something about what happens in the skies that captures our attention, possibly because it's so otherworldly 
and yet it feels like it's right in front of us. And so this morning we celebrate Epiphany and we have this story where the star of the story really is this star. And I think one of the reasons we like it so much is because it uses an image that we can really relate to. We can see it. We can look up in the skies and see the brightness of what is out there, particularly on winter nights when we have much more darkness than we do um, at other times of the year. We can go out and look up and the sky seems so clear and, you know, there are stars and planets and constellations. Um, that feel like we could just put our hands right underneath them. At the same time, we know that they are so distant, they are called light years away from us. Um, and so we just are captivated by those. But certainly, lights in a dark sky can be both mysterious and compelling. Well, obviously, from ancient days, people have looked up and been fascinated by what they saw. Astrologers and theologians have long wondered about the star in this story. Was it a particular one? Was it the way the planets were aligned that appeared to be just one bright globe? If you're interested in that, you can Google that or look it up. There are a lot of theories about what that star was and if we can still see it today. And it's nice to imagine in December when we look up and see a bright star in the sky that perhaps that is the one that guided people to the Christ child. Of course, we know so much more now than our ancestors did. We have rockets that go into space with people on them. We have an international space station that is above us, um, and people are living and working there. I have an app on my phone that lets me know the international space station is crossing over you right now. It's, it's simply amazing. <laughs> But just imagine what it's like for those people who are able to go into space and live and work there because they see God's handiwork from uh, that vantage point. Well, observing the stars and the heavens, whether it's an ordinary night or one in which I'm surprised by a falling star, puts me in a thin place, that place where it feels like earth and heaven are separated only by a very fragile veil. And sometimes in those thin places, something occurs that changes us, something that might be obvious or is just hinted at. That's an epiphany, a spiritual insight or perspective or an understanding that the theologian Diana Butler Bass describes as something that we can't ignore. We can't shake it off. Something grabs our attention and then it wants us to take some kind of action. And a model for this, again, is this story where these wise men saw something that they could not ignore. And so not even understanding what all it was, they set out to follow it. And she suggests that we too should be active recipients of whatever is revealed to us. Well, as is the case, of course, with the entire Christmas story reported by various sources, this piece of it is only a snapshot. It's just a few scenes of what our ancestors thought happened and what became the narrative as each generation shared it with the next. And there's room in the story for our imaginations to wonder and fill in some pieces. It's, it's, it's fun to share this with children and ask them to imagine, well, where do you think all of those wise men went on their way to find Jesus. Well, how do you think they got there? How did they get their food? And then, you know, just to talk to them about, you know, how we might imagine ourselves in a story translated over the generations for our time and our context. Well, of course, we have more information, again, than we could possibly want about what's out there, apps on our phone and our electronic devices that show us what we're looking at. As I noted, when I was a child, mom took me outside and pointed everything out to me. Now I can walk out there with my iPad and put my little app on and look up and look at the iPad and it'll tell me exactly what I'm looking at. Um, and if I'm in another part of the country, it'll tell me what it is there. It's amazing. But those wise men didn't have all of that. All they had were their keen senses of observation and it's, it, they may well have been astrologers. Um, they may well have been those professional people that watched the skies 
to see whether things were happening or not that they were familiar with. Now, sometimes it is something extraordinary that gets our attention, but often God works in and through the very things with which we are most familiar, so that for these men, these astrologers, a very bright star would have been noticed, but they wouldn't necessarily have left their homes to go follow it. As the story is recorded, they knew, though, the moment they saw it, that something more was happening than just another bright star. It captivated them, and they were compelled then to respond. Well, as noted in our text, there were stories that said that a promised Messiah was going to come. But these men were not Jewish, and so they might have heard about that, they might have noted it, but they wouldn't have set out to follow something that didn't relate to them personally. There were also some pagan legends that said a ruler would be born, and again, a lot of people attributed something in the sky to the announcement of those things happening. And again, they would have looked at it, but not necessarily have changed their lives for it. But the, the star called them to respond, and so they set out on a journey not knowing where they were going or how long it would be. And our familiar scenes of the nativity notwithstanding, according to Matthew, they met the Holy Family in a house, not a stable. So it's pretty clear there was some time that went by before they arrived. And along their way, these men encountered Herod, and were confronted with a choice they really didn't comprehend until they found the child and then recognized that they could not go back the same route. They could not go back and tell Herod what they had discovered. This was a difficult and dangerous time as Herod was determined to be sure that no one would threaten his throne and his rule. He heard about a child that was supposedly going to be born, and that child would be a great leader, and he wanted to know what was going on. And so he summoned these travelers and instructed them to return. And he was so enraged when he found out that they had gone home without reporting to him, he ordered all of the children up to two years old to be killed. And then Joseph took his family to Egypt for their protection, and that's where Jesus lived the first couple of years of his life until it was safe for them to return home. And in this context, we find people who observed something by looking up and out into the universe and recognized it meant something special. The wise men could not ignore the brilliance of a particular star, whether they understood exactly what it was asking of them or not, but it led them to find something that changed their lives and brought them to their knees. Perhaps we need to look up to see what is right in front of us before we decide how to go forward. Well, we know we believe in an amazing God who is at the same time completely beyond time and space and yet as close to us as our own breath. Observing the skies can remind us that whatever our circumstance, we are part of something much larger and grander than we can imagine. We are neither too big nor too small, we're not forgotten, nor are we greater than anyone else. And we all see the same sky, but from very different perspectives. Surely that is part of God's master plan, that there are lenses through which we experience God and many ways to express what we believe. Looking up, we can engage a sense of awe and wonder that drenches us in the reality of the kingdom of God that is breaking in right here and right now. The prophecy of Isaiah, ancient words that Kathy read, says, lift up your eyes and look around. And we can translate that to where we are all these centuries later. Lift up your eyes and look around, for a star just might capture our attention and hold an epiphany for us. Well, of course, this is the beginning of a new year, and many of us have made resolutions and commitments. I won't ask you if you've made them or if you've already kept them or are abandoning them. But we, we, you know, it's good to have a new year, a new beginning, and start out on a fresh path. And perhaps it might be um, a good thing for us to do to look up, look out, look beyond that which is so familiar, 
to see if there isn't an epiphany for us, a revelation if we are just paying attention or attuned to the possibilities of a sacred surprise. A sacred surprise might indeed be the light that we need to go forward, whatever our circumstance. Friends, at the beginning of this new year, may it be so. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn is number 306, Bless Be the Tie That Binds, verses 1, 2, and 3.